Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our webinar series. This is Sepide Janka, uh, Director of Marketing and Product Development at Sterling Tech. Our webinar today focuses on polymeric flat sheet membranes, their selection criteria, and their application. Here is a brief summary about um, my background, and um, I also have Sarah Azari joining me today. So I finished my PhD in civil and environmental engineering at UBC Vancouver. Um, I investigated the effect of hydrodynamic conditions on the fouling rate in GE membrane filtration systems, and I have uh, more than 12 years of experience in the filtration industry. Um, Sarah is, Azari is also joining me today. I let her introduce herself. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for joining us today. This is Sarah and I have PhD in chemical engineering. Um, my PhD research was focused on surface modification of reverse osmosis membranes to prevent membrane fouling. Uh, at my postdoc, I work on developing graphene oxide membranes and altogether I have more than 10 years of uh, academic research experience in the area of membrane fabrication and membrane process development. All right, thank you, Sarah. So with that, a brief um, history about Sterling Tech Corporation. Sterling Tech was founded in 2001 uh, with a unique silver membrane product line. Uh, we manufacture more than 2,000 um, products, uh, filtration products mainly. Our headquarter is in Kent, Washington, um, and we got certified for ISO 9001 last year, actually two years ago. Um, we have grown over the past 18 years from four to more than 30 employees. And we had about 20% growth uh, in domestic and international sales in 2018. What is our mission? Sterling Tech aims to equip scientists, entrepreneurs, and visionaries with filtration products to transform ideas into reality. Some of you have already worked with Sterling Tech and you're more or less familiar with our scope of work. So what is on the agenda for today? We start with a very brief introduction about membrane filtration. Um, we'll talk about membrane selection criteria, what type of membrane filtration processes are out there, um, how to conduct feasibility studies using membrane flat sheets, and then finally how to transit, do a transition to a full-size membrane filtration system. And we have a few minutes at the end for questions and answers. So why are we looking at um, membrane filtration and um, cri uh, selection criteria today? Let's assume you are an application engineer in the textile industry and um, you're tasked with finding the right technology to separate dye from wastewater. Um, and that would be using membrane filtration technology. The question is, what is membrane and how does it work? What are the membrane selection criteria? How do you choose the right membrane? If you have the right membrane, um, what type of processes are out there um, that would um, take a membrane and um, for, the for the filtration and separation process. And finally, the question is, is membrane filtration even a feasible solution? And if it is, how can we move to a full-size system eventually? So uh, we'll start with a brief description or history of what membrane is and how does it work. Um, Again, a lot of you guys may be familiar with membrane filtration, so I won't go into more details, but a membrane is a semi-permeable, thin and porous sheet of material that can separate some contaminants from feed solution uh, when a driving force is applied. You can imagine a coffee filter um, is a type of membrane, and you can separate the brewed coffee <coughs> from um, the grains. So concentrate and retentate is the impermeable components retained on the feed side of the membrane. And permeate is the permeable component that pass through a membrane. So now that we know what a membrane is, what are the membrane selection criteria? Depending on the type of process and application you're dealing with, there are several membrane selection criteria that you should keep in mind. 
One of the most important one is chemical compatibility with the feed solution. You want to make sure the membrane material you choose is compatible with your solution and it doesn't change characteristics over time. Membrane pore size is another important parameter um, because that's how um, selection or separation process actually works based on the membrane pore size or in some cases salt or dissolved solid rejection if you're dealing with fine pores. You also need to keep in mind about temperature limits, pH limits, and in some cases affinity for water and membrane surface charges. So now the question is what are the membrane selection criteria and what type of membrane processes are out there? So I will pass this now back to Sarah and she can um, go a little bit into more details about these two questions. I'm going to talk about the pressure-driven membrane process, which is the most common mode of operation. Uh, based on the pore size of the membrane used in a pressure-driven membrane process, um, this process is commonly divided into four uh, categories uh, with uh, like a microfiltration process with largest membrane pore size on the top and reverse osmosis membrane process with the smallest membrane pore size at the bottom of this uh, category. If you look at the filtration spectrum for the uh, reverse osmosis membrane, uh, the pore size of these membranes are smaller than one nanometer, and these membranes are technically uh, non-porous. And the polymeric membrane materials that are uh, common uh, for this uh, application are mostly polyamide uh, uh, thin film composite membrane materials and cellulose acetate and cellulose acetate blend materials. Um, these membranes all feature uh, very high salt rejection and this uh, very high salt rejection. Um, this membrane, we have a wide selection uh, of these uh, membranes from uh, uh, various manufacturers that you can see in here. Um, Oro membranes are very uh, popular for the application in seawater desalination uh, because they can reject monovalent ions. Uh, but another interesting application of oral membranes in food industry is to concentrate maple sap. And oral membrane is used instead of the conventional heating and evaporation uh, treatment technique. Uh, uh, next, after oral membranes, we have nanofiltration membrane. Um, nanofiltration membrane pore size is uh, from about one nanometer to about 10 nanometer. Um, so these membranes are capable of separating divalent ions. Um, the polymeric membrane materials that are available for this uh, in this range are uh, polyamide thin film composite membranes and cellulose acetate membranes. We also have polyether sulfone membranes. Uh, these membranes um, um, are considered as loose NF membrane. The salt rejection is uh, lower than the polyamide uh, based membranes or cellulose acetate based membranes. However, these membranes um, offer very excellent uh, resistance to acidic and basic solutions. These membranes are also available from uh, various manufacturers, as you can see in here. Um, very interesting application of uh, NF membranes in pharmaceutical industry is to separate and purify antibiotics synthesized from enzyme-based fermentation broths. Actually, an NF membrane can be used in here uh, because the synthesized antibiotic can pass through the NF membrane and the larger size mo uh, molecules such as polypeptides or te tetracyclines uh, are retained by the membrane. And this is the way that NF membrane can be used to uh, purify this uh, synthesized antibiotic. Um, after NF membrane, we have ultrafiltration membranes. The pore size of these membranes are to 0.1 uh, micrometer. And the membrane materials that are available in, the, uh, in this range are, again, polyamide thin film composite membranes. We have polyether sulfone and polyether sulfone hydrophilic. We have PVDF membrane, which is uh, uh, highly stable uh, against oxidizing agents. It offers very good chemical compatibility and it has low protein binding. We also have pan membranes here, which is a hydrophilic membrane material. and that makes it suitable for oil water separation and treating um, feed water streams that contain oil emulsions. These membranes are also available from uh, various uh, manufacturers such as Swiss, Tricep, Cinder, and Macrodyne. Um, 
looking at the real life application of um, UF membranes for dairy industry, these membranes can be used to process and concentrate skim milk. Um, and the very the most common membrane material for this application is polyether sulfone uh, membrane material. The very last one in the pressure-driven membrane process uh, category is microfiltration membrane. Um, the pore size for these membranes is about 0 0.1 to 1 micrometer, and the polymeric membrane uh, that are available um, uh, in this range are PVDF, PES, and we also offer a wide selection of the macrofilters uh, from PES, PTFE, PAN, mixed ester, PVDF, uh, without any backing support, and also poor structure, which makes them suitable for normal flu application. If you are interested to know more about those macrofilters, you can watch our past webinar uh, on introduction to macrofiltration membrane. Um, we also uh, have a link in here for, for that. Um, so I, I briefly covered uh, pressure-driven membrane process and also the membrane materials that are available for this process. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about osmotically driven membrane processes. Uh, driving force for this process, uh, for separation in this process, is an osmotic pressure gradient, and it's not a hydraulic force. Actually, uh, in this process, draw solution, which has higher osmotic activity relative to that of the feed solution, creates the driving force across the membrane. If you look at the filtration spectrum for the forward osmosis membrane, uh, the pore size uh, of the forward osmosis membrane is very similar to our own membrane, and the membrane material that is available uh, in this range are cellulose triacetate uh, uh, membrane, and this membrane is manufactured by Fluid Technology Solution. Interesting application of uh, FO membrane uh, in food and beverage industry is concentrating and dewatering of the fruit juice. Actually, the fruit juice, which is dewatered uh, using an, a forward osmosis process, uh, can retain the original flavor, color, and uh, nutritional values uh, much better than the um, like a conventional heating and um, evaporation um, techniques. The very last uh, membrane process that I'm going to talk about is a temperature-driven membrane process. In this process, driving force for separation is partial vapor pressure difference induced by a temperature difference. If you look at this picture, um, vapor passes through a hydrophobic membrane and it gets condensed on the cold stream side of the membrane. Uh, impurities are left behind in the feed solution because they cannot be transferred by the water vapor. And this is how a, a membrane distillation uh, process works. Uh, membranes that are suitable for membrane distillation uh, have like a pore sizes around 0 0.1 micrometer to about 0 0.3 micrometer. We, uh, the membrane material, the polymer membrane materials that are available for this uh, process are PVDF, PEAK, PTFE, and polypropylene. And the, feed, the, the feature of these membrane materials is that they are all highly hydrophobic. Um, an application in, uh, of the membrane distillation, a uh, real-life application of membrane distillation is uh, treating high uh, salinity uh, wastewater produced in natural gas extra extraction process, and since in this in that process um, um, the salinity of water is very high and waste heat is available, uh, membrane distillation is the most suitable uh, membrane separation process for this uh, application. Okay, I. I briefly covered uh, all the membrane materials that we offer for like uh, in different membrane um, processes, uh, but those membranes that I talk about are um, are most suitable when water is used as the filtration medium. We also offer solvent resistant membranes that are resistant toward organic solvents and can be used uh, when. Um, organic solvents is used as a filtration medium. For example, in the nanofiltration range, uh, we have polyimide membrane, uh, thin film composite polyimide membranes. In the ultrafiltration range, we have peak membranes. And in macrofiltration range, we have PTFE and polypropylene membranes. Um, 
those membranes are mainly manufactured by Ivanik and Novame. I talked about the different membrane processes and also the membrane materials that are available for each process. Now I'm going to pass it to Safide and she's going to tell you about how to see if a membrane process is suitable for your specific kind of application. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Thank you, Sarah. So based on what Sarah covered, um, going back to our example, um, you have an idea based on the size of the dye paint uh, molecules. Um, you probably are looking for an RO or an NF membrane with very poor size um, pore sizes um, in a pressure driven application or you're looking at forward osmosis membrane in an osmotically driven process. So now how do you know uh, which one is going to work? What is the efficiency and if membrane filtration is even a feasible solution for this application? So what researchers do is um, they start with bench top or bench scale so, um, feasibility testing. Um, that mean, what that means is using a membrane coupon sampled from a large scale membrane module um, offered by major manufacturers in the industry and test that in a bench top uh, or bench scale filtration setup. Um, I'm showing an example here on this slide. What it is, is, is a cross flow cell with an inlet for feed and then an outlet for the concentrate. You have the membrane coupon in the middle and then uh, permeate goes through the membrane and is collected on the top of the cell. So why this is advantageous is because you only need a small feed volume. Uh, this cell can mimic hydrodynamic conditions of larger scale spiral wound membrane modules if you use uh, spacers and shims in there to create that same uh, uh, geometry. And then using this system with a small feed volume and a small membrane coupon, you can determine which material and pore size is most effective for the given application. And you can find the optimum operating condition and develop your separation process. As Sarah covered briefly um, at Sterling Tech, the advantage is um, we offer membrane coupons or membrane samples from most of the major membrane suppliers in the industry. I'm not gonna go through the list, but some of them are, um, are shown here. And these are available in different sizes. Um, and we can also offer them in custom sizes if you have your own bench scale uh, or bench top filtration setup. Uh, we can sell them in larger sheets so you can cut them to fit in your setup or they can come in um, pre-cut for the cells that Sterlitech offers. So the next step past um, benchtop testing and feasibility testing is how can we move to a full size system um, using these membrane samples and coupons and these small benchtop filtration setups. The next step is really pilot testing. Uh, what I'm showing here is two different systems. One is a digital system, which has pressure, flow, um, conductivity, temperature, and other sensors in it. Uh, what it is featuring is two 1812 um, spiral wound elements um, and housings for those. Um, so this is the next size up. That's the smallest uh, um, spiral wound membrane module available commercially. And then this one on the right um, is a 2540 or 4040. That means 2.5 inches diameter and 40 inches length, or 4040 means four inches diameter and 40 inches length. Um, so this is, um, again, another step up from 1812, which is 1 1.8 inches diameter and um, 12 inches length. Um, so when you're happy with the efficiencies that you achieve on a, uh, in a bench top filtration setup. The next step is to go to a pilot scale uh, filtration testing and then um, either do small batch productions or feasibility testing and then do um, transit uh, or transfer all the information to a full size scale and then go back to the membrane manufacturer and then talk about a commercially um, available system for your application. 
So with that, we come to the end of this uh, webinar. We covered uh, what membrane filtration is, what are the membrane selection criteria and different types of membrane filtration processes, how you can conduct feasibility studies using membrane flat sheets, and um, briefly discussed about transition to full-size membrane filtration system. Um, now we have a few minutes for questions and answers. In order to give you guys a uh, few minutes to uh, post your questions into the question section on the chat, um, I'm just going to briefly introduce you our next webinar. Our next webinar is going to be in November, and um, this is going to be focused on application of membrane filtration, and mainly the solvent-resistant membranes for cannabis oil um, extraction. If you have any questions that we are not able to answer today, feel free to reach out to Sarah and myself. Um, our email addresses are up there, and we'll send you a copy of this webinar um, at the end, and um, we can. I will be happy to answer those questions. So I have um, one question here. The question is, I would like to know what membranes are good for dye separation. Sarah, do you want to take this one? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, for dye separation, if you are thinking about uh, uh, separating dye from dyeing wastewater effluent, um, I would recommend you to use either polyamide thin film composite NF membranes or um, or ultrafiltration membranes with a very uh, low pore size. Um, so, like uh, using these membranes, you can separate dyes from the salts and sulfides uh, which are available in the in the wastewater stream. Um, yeah, uh, and then yeah, it all depends on the size of the dye. If the dye uh, is a large size, I would say you can easily go with the ultrafiltration membrane. And if your dyes are very water soluble and their size is kind of small, I would say it's better to go with nanofiltration membranes. All right, thank you. Um, next question says, do we have one system to test RO and uh, FO and MD? MD is membrane distillation. I can take this one. Um, so RO um, is a pressure-driven process, um, and FO is a um, osmotic-driven process. So you would need two pumps for running in FO mode and one high-pressure pump for running in RO mode and membrane distillation. Um, you also need two pumps, one low-pressure and one high-pressure. Um, one thing we have done at Sterotech is we have a system and we call it convertible. So you can have two pumps, one high pressure and one low pressure on that system. You can run your RO um, membranes um, in an RO mode with the high pressure. And then you can use a combination of low pressure and high pressure pumps uh, installed on that system um, to run in parallel modes. Um, and you can run either FO or membrane distillation using the same system. Um, but again, you would need two pumps, one high pressure and one low pressure. Um, the next question um, is about selection criteria for filtration systems. Uh, Sarah, um, this one reads membrane size, process types, and what other selection criteria do we need to consider uh, for selection of filtration systems? Um, right. Uh, I would say that for selecting a right filtration system, the first thing is the is the nature of the feed solution that determines the the type of the process which is required. Also, I would say like the availability of the energy. If you have like a draw solution, um, like which is available in your um, in your site, if you have waste heat available in your site, or if you can easily uh, supply like a um, high pressure pumps to, to supply like a hydraulic pressure on the membrane. So all those things um, de um, determines the, the membrane process type. And after we come up with the right membrane process, we should look at the, the volume of the feed solution that you are going to process in a day and also the volume of the permeate that um, aims to be generated and then all together having all those information uh, we 
can come up with the right size membrane um, separation um, system. Um, so like, yeah, so based on all those information, you can find the right size membrane, or membrane that is right size for you and the, the, the right size system. Um, and I hope that answered the question. All right, thank you. I have a comment here. Uh, we have someone joining us from Quebec, Canada, and um, I think uh, we are all happy we talk about maple syrup. Um, so <laughs> thank you for the comment. Um, and I have one more question here. It says, where can I find product information? I assume this is regarding Sterlitech products. Um, so we have our catalog on our website and I can include a link uh, when I send the webinar out um, to you guys. So you can find our catalog on our webpage and then all the products and um, information and specification are in there. And again, if you have any more specific questions, feel free to email me or Sarah and we will both be happy to, um, to respond. And um, I have one more question here. Um, the question reads, which pump, make and model do you suggest for lab scale experiments for nanofiltration? Um, Sarah, do you want to take this one or you want me to answer? Uh, sorry, I didn't get that question. Well, um, so which, which pumps, mm -hmm. make and model do you suggest for lab scale experiments for nanofiltration? Yeah, so like for lab scale, um, experiment of nanofiltration, I would say a positive displacement pump that can go to pressures up to maybe 500 PSI are suitable for this application. And I would say like a, the, the flow range about the two, one GPM should be um, enough, but it again depends on the size of the of the membrane test cell that you are using. But like um, if you are using like a test cell, which is not uh, which is not too big, um, like if you are familiar with your SIPA cell. Uh, so it's, if it's kind of up to the size of our SIPA cell, I would say like a 1 GPM flu will be sufficient for that pump. Um, okay. So, yeah. Thank you. I'm going to take one last question and then we actually received quite a few questions. Um, we will reach out to you guys with the answer. Uh, but this last one says, what cross-flow velocity would you recommend for running NF membranes for testing them in a CFO42P and why? So CFO42P is uh, actually the cell I was showing earlier. So it is uh, this cell, this one, the one showing here is made um, of acrylic, so it's transparent. Uh, but these cells are offered in different material of construction. And the question is about the PTFE version of the same cell. Um, so the material doesn't change um, the, the fact like what cross flow velocity you would need, what it, uh, what dictates the cross flow velocity is really the geometry of the cell, um, the depth of that feed channel and the width of that feed channel. Um, what we recommend is um, if you are trying to mimic hydrodynamic conditions of larger spiral wound elements, um, stay within the range that manufacturers recommend uh, for the type of element you will be uh, transitioning in the future. Let's say you're, uh, you're going to be um, using a 40 for the element from Suez G. Um, they, each manufacturer has a set of guidelines for recommended uh, cross flow velocity in your system. And we can help you calculate the cross flow velocity in the system based on the flow rate that you circulate in the system to stay within that range. And we actually have a blog post on our page and um, we can share that again with you. Um, so you can choose the flow rate to create that cross flow velocity range. Um, so you can actually um, correlate the data uh, or the results you obtain here in that small scale to um, a large or full-size system in the future. Um, so with that, I would just like to um, thank you everyone for joining this morning and feel free to follow us on LinkedIn or other social media channels and stay in touch. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you everyone for joining us today and please feel free to email me if there is any question and I will be happy to respond. All right, thanks. Bye-bye.